things like that, but I have never crashed a plane. Knock on wood. Uh, yes. Patty, did you ever have much trouble with civilian airplanes coming into your zone? Oh, firefighting? Yes. Um, sometimes we did. Um, usually I'd make a call if we're near an airport and make these blind calls every few minutes, you know, five minutes. Um, but it can be a problem. And now the big problem is drones that are, people are sending drones up into, and they should know better in California because it's a big thing there. And, but they're sending drones up into these active, active fire traffic areas and they have to stop operations. You can't fly, you know, so that's, that's becoming a problem. Once in a while, we'd have a problem, yeah. They, they didn't take it lightly either. They'd get, they'd get pretty mad. Um, I had a hand over here. What was your favorite plane you ever flew? My favorite plane was maybe the blue one with the butterflies or the P-51. <laughs> yeah. You have, one, you have one last one over there, Tom? Okay. Patty, in your uh, 38 years, your logbook, how many aircraft types, how many hours? I have about 11,000 hours, um, and I've probably flown 150, maybe, planes, something. You know, but I mean, when I say 150, I'm saying 152 and 172, you know, and so it's a good question, because they asked me that earlier, too. So I've been, you know, I've been fortunate, but I, I've, it's been my life's work to fly cool airplanes, you know? So if I see something I really want to fly, I find a way to make it happen, you know, and let people know that's what I want to do. And, you know, um, kind of, you know, find, find ways to, find ways to make it happen, so. Again, I just want to say thank you to everybody who came Thanks. out tonight. Patty, thank you again on behalf of the staff, the members, and uh, the folks who come out every uh, month to support the speaker series. Thanks. Uh, thank you again for coming out and spending the evening with us. Well, when EAA calls and asks if you come and speak, you don't say no. <laughs> like, of course. Are you kidding? Just a I chance to, to be date, here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys again. Thank you all thank for you coming. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another workshop presentation during EA Together, our Spirit of Aviation Week. My name is Mark Forrest, and I'm with Joe Norris. And this afternoon, we're going to be talking about fabric covering, one of the oldest traditional methods in terms of building an aircraft that really dates back to the early days of the Wright gliders and the Wright flyers and continues on today. I mean, it, even though it's an old technology, we use it in, in modern aircraft, we use it in restorations, all sorts of things. So. Right, yep, it uh, certainly has stood the test of time. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, this goes back to well before the Wright brothers, all the, uh, the, the Lilienthal and all of those that were working with the early gliders and just trying to figure out flight were all using some uh, version of fabric covering. And they started out with just simple uh, organic fabrics with no coatings on them. And then uh, even the Wright brothers airplane, if you look at the, uh, the Wright brothers airplane in the Smithsonian, you'll notice that it's covered with fabric, but there's no coating on it. It's just it's just a tight weave fabric that they use. Yeah, some kind of cotton or it linen. It's a muslin, I believe, muslin. Is what they okay, called it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then they did uh, in the early 1900s, or shortly after the Wright brothers uh, flew their aircraft and they started uh, realizing that they could go with a lighter fabric if they would seal it somehow oh. so that the air wouldn't pass through Oh, so it. that was a difference. They yeah. were they're trading off coating for the thickness of the material. Exactly. And what sure. they did was they, they first found out that using those organic fabrics, uh, the, the cottons and the, and the linens that they used back in those days, uh, they found out that they could use uh, what they called nitrate coating, which they, uh, they called dope. And sure. of course, the word dope has a way different meaning today than it did back then. But, right. Uh, back in those days, anytime somebody mentioned dope, they knew they were talking about aircraft covering materials. Sure. So they started out with the nitrate uh, dopes, and uh, those were very good for what they were used for, except for the problem that they were very flammable, even yeah. in their cured state. In fact, uh, you've all seen pictures of the Hindenburg disaster, uh, that huge fireball. Well, a lot of people think that fireball was the hydrogen that was in the, in the aircraft, in the dirigible. 
The, the hydrogen actually burned away very quickly, but that set their nitrate dope on fire. The whole a gas bag was, was covered with nitrate dope, sure. and it just burned and burned and burned. And that's that huge fireball that you see in that picture was the nitrate dope that was burning. Well, the nitrates were sort of early, early plastics, and not only with fabric covering, but they used nitrocellulose for film stock, and that was a challenge too because of the flammability issue. Exactly. So, so they, they, between World War One and World War II, uh, they tried to overcome that flammability issue, and they came up with what they called the butyrate dopes. And they were still flammable to a point, but they were much less flammable oh, than sure. the nitrates. Mm -hmm. And they worked very well on the cottons and the linens, just like the nitrate did. Yes. So all those years during World War II, that was primarily, again, cottons and linens. They were using organic fabrics, and they used the butyrate dope, and that cut down on the fire problem quite a bit. Um, then in the late 50s, early 60s, they started to develop our synthetic fabrics, our, our, our polyester fabrics. Um, and they ran into a problem right away because the butyrate dope would not stick to the to the polyester fabrics at all. Yeah, because they're, those are basically strands of plastic. Mm, yep, monofilament strands. There's no little fuzzy hairs. There's nothing there yeah. for for the uh, uh, dopes sure. to hold on to. Yeah. So they found out that if they would completely encapsulate all of those strands with nitrate dope. Um, it would adhere, so they were back to nitrate again. But what they did was they put a layer of nitrate on to encapsulate those fibers and then went butyrate on top of that to try to cut down on the flammability as much as sure. they could. So we, get, we got to a point where they were using a combination of nitrate and butyrate again on these new, then new um, monofilament uh, polyester yeah, synthetic the, fabrics. The stuff. And of course the thing that they gained by going to the polyester fabrics was longevity because the cotton fabrics and the linen fabrics were great fabrics, but they would deteriorate over time. Organic. The sun would get them and, yeah. and you know, mildew and all kinds of problems they had, and sure. they were looking for something that would last longer because in the days of a lot of fabric-covered airplanes in the 30s, 40s, 50s, about every 10 years you'd uncover the airplane and do a new fabric job on it because yeah. the fabric would simply deteriorate. And that's very expensive. And, well, and even, time even in the time. And time, yeah. consuming, and time consuming on top yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they uh, were able to overcome by going to the polyester fabrics was the shrinkage problem. Because um, number one, with the cottons and the linens, you had to physically get those to shrink by using water. Oh, so you'd okay. put them on a little bit loose and then you'd wet them to a certain extent. And, and the, the folks that were into fabric covering kind of figured out how wet they needed to be and, and how much shrinkage they needed to do before they added the dope. But the dope would also continue to shrink. Uh -huh. And, and it literally over the entire life of the aircraft, the dope would continue to slightly shrink and shrink and shrink. And so if they put the fabric on too tight, well, what happened was the dope would continue to shrink and over time it would start to deform the structure because it oh. would really pull hard. Wow. So they had to really be careful of how much shrinkage they put into the material before they put the coatings on and then they would allow for that continued gradual shrinkage. And that was kind of an art because there's no tester that you can really Absolutely. put on. Absolutely. Yep. It was it. all about the, the touch and feel and, the, yeah. and those that had experience with it just kind of had a feel for just how much shrinkage they could uh, yeah, allow Yeah, so that for. makes it really challenging. Exactly. And so now they come out with the polyester fabrics. It doesn't shrink with, with the water. It doesn't shrink with the coatings. We shrink it with heat, which we'll de demonstrate here in a little while. Yeah. And once it's shrunk, then these newer coatings we use now don't continue to shrink anymore. So you uh, develop your tension right away when you do your covering, and, and you're, and you're fine. Yeah. Now, uh, originally, again, when we started using the uh, polyester fabrics, they did use the nitrate and butyrate dopes, which do shrink. And so they developed uh, newer formulations of those dopes to minimize that shrinkage. And you, you'll actually see it on the, you look at the labels nowadays, and it'll say non tautening butyrate. Oh. Well, it does tauten a little bit, but much less than the original butyrates did. So they were able to develop the, the dopes at that time that would aid that, you know, kind of sure. get away from that uh, traditional shrinkage that they had to worry about. So you'd yeah. tighten your fabric with your, with your iron, which we'll, we'll demonstrate here in a little while, and you put your non tautening coatings on there and pretty well could say we're good to go. We wouldn't have to really worry about that additional shrinkage. So. Sure. So it was a great improvement. But they still had the issue with the possible flammability. Yeah. Um, especially that um, undercoat of nitrate that was on that bare fabric when they put it on Yeah, there. that stuff just goes woof. Uh, and the problem with that is from the outside of the airplane where all your coatings are, it's fine. You got your butyrate out there. But the inside of the fabric was still a bare coat of nitrate on the back side of that fabric. So if something sparked in the airplane, or God forbid somebody was smoking in there or something, which people used to do back in the day, yeah, right. um, they could ignite that 
uh, nitrate dope on the inside of the airplane and the thing would just uh, I mean go up boom you know sure. it, would, it would burn just like the Hindenburg did yeah I never knew that yeah wow. so so they they really wanted to get away from that and so uh, some people started working on different things and one of the people that really came up with a good solution was Ray Stitz now that's a name that a lot of old time EA members will remember because Ray uh, developed a number of home built designs the Stitz Playboy and, and the Playmate and some of these other aircraft but while he was developing those... And, and founded Chapter 1. And founded EA <laughs> Chapter 1, absolutely. Uh, but while he was working on those home builds, he was also trying to come up with uh, uh, an answer to this, this whole issue. And he ended up developing what he called the Stitz process, which is all based on vinyl. It's a vinyl-based material. Very, very... I mean, it, you can get it to ignite if you put enough heat on it, but it isn't readily flammable like yeah. the nitrates and the butyrates are. So sure. it's very much more... Uh, safe in that regard. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, the fumes are flammable, so you have to watch out when you're actually working it's, with it's the materials. It's it still have off, it has off it's a solvent base. It's a yeah. solvent based product. So Basically, you, plastic that's melted with the solvents. Right, exactly. So you have to, you know, you should have a well ventilated shop, and you shouldn't yeah. be, you know, breathing right over the can and all that of course, kind of stuff. Yeah. But but once it's cured. It is very, very, very resistant to to flammability. I mean, it literally, if you could take a strip of it and put fire to it, it'll it'll curl up and melt, but it won't burst into flame. Sure. So very, very safe compared to those earlier coating materials. Nice. So that's uh, that's kind of the state of the art in the 60s and early 70s. And of course, since then, there's been other uh, fabric covering uh, materials, uh, other chemically based and, and water based materials out there now. So there's several different systems you can use that yeah. all get away from that flammability. Sure. But there are still people that use the old nitrates and butyrates if they want a real uh, a realistic restoration. Yeah, yeah, if they want a restoration that will, uh, you know, really bring it back to its original condition. There, sure. I mean. There is a couple of places where you can still get cotton fabric. It's really hard to find nowadays, and, and hardly anybody remembers how to even do it anymore. Yeah. The, the, those artisans that were back in, in the early days are all unfortunately gone now. So yeah, but if you were building a Wright Brothers replica, you'd want to try to recreate yeah, that. Or even even if you're building a museum-quality replica of, yeah. of something out of the, of the, you know, the 1920s, you might want to actually go back and get the linen or cotton fabric and do it exactly the way they did. Yeah, it'd be like using composite on a Bugatti. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah you so, don't do that. Yeah. So, but if, if you're if you're if you're even if you're restoring that type of airplane and you're going to fly it, you're going to use it in today's world. Everybody's going to the polyester yeah. fabrics because I mean it's the longevity is is longer than you really want to leave it on the airplane. Whereas back in the cotton days, the fabric would wear out and you'd take it off every. 10 or 15 years sure. because the fabric was rotten. Yeah. Now you cover the airplane with, with uh, polyurethane or uh, polyester and you take it off because you're worried about the underlying structure being rotten, your yeah. rust or corrosion or whatever the so, case so might be. So literally the, the covering is outlasting yeah. the, if, the if, skeleton. Yeah, if the aircraft is, is well restored when you put it together and it's well kept as far as being kept out of the weather, kept inside, not left out in the sun, uh, the, the aircraft and the fabric will last far beyond the, the life of the owner. So uh, decades. Decades, absolutely. Yep. That's great. An interesting uh, thing happened during this transition period when they, they, they'd already developed the, the polyester fabrics, yeah. but the, the factories that were making the fabric weren't making all of the additional parts like uh, fabric tapes, your reinforcing tapes, and all of the different uh, other items you might need. So for a while, there was some factories who were building fa uh, fabric-covered airplanes that put polyester fabric on and then use cotton tapes on top of that because oh, that's wow. all they could get. Sure. Well, okay, now we got an airplane that sits out in the sun a little bit. Ten years down the line, the fabric is great, and the tapes are literally blowing off the airplane because they're all rotten. They're all, sure. So they had to go right back and start the same process over to repair those tapes. They didn't have to cover, uncover the whole airplane, but they had to do almost as much work in re, you know, get it prepped to prepped to redo so they, things. So yeah. then they could now finally put polyester tapes on it and get it so that it would last forever. But wow. now, of course, yeah. we have all the polyester tapes and everything, and we yeah. can go fully all the way up through the the like a stitch process, or which we now call polyfiber, uh, and uh, they don't have to worry about that everything rotting on them sure. just from uh, you know environmental yep. issues. So, so that's kind of the background of it. Okay, um, and. When uh, Ray was starting Chapter One and Paul was getting EA up and running and yeah. all that, probably virtually all of the home-built aircraft back in that time were fabric-covered. 
Yeah. Steel tube fuselages, wood wing construction. That's been, was, uh, has been the traditional exactly. method in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, a lot of your a lot of your aircraft that were kitted at that. Well, I really kitted even it was just plans and, just and plans, raw yeah. materials. Uh, you were going to do fabric covering, so yeah. it was very very popular back then. Uh, and of course, nowadays, when, when most people think of a home built aircraft, the first thing they think of is a metal airplane. Yeah. You got Sonics and you got Vans and yeah, you got, you know, or even, even go back one generation and you had the T 18 and the, you know, the Midget Mustang and all those. Sure. You know, those were all the, the premier metal airplanes coming up. Uh, In the when they mid 60s. They started to yeah. supplant the, uh, you know, the airplanes were going faster and they had bigger engines available and, and all these different things. But there are still. Uh, either plans built or some kit built aircraft today that employ fabric covering in some way or shape. It might be just yeah. the wings, it might be just the fuselage, uh, could be the whole aircraft. And of course, there's still factory built airplanes out there that are fabric covered. The the Cubs that are out there, they're being built in the LSA world or in the uh, the Bush pilot world. Yeah. Uh, Aviat Husky, the Pitzes, uh, you know, a lot of those aircraft, uh, even, even some of the modern aerobatic airplanes, the extras and some of those, the wings are either composite or wood or something, but the, the fuselages are still tube and fabric. Uh, yeah, even, even some of the modern LSAs I've noticed, they use a, a, a composite fuselage, but it's fabric wings, some yep. of the European imports. Right, yeah. So, uh, so which, which amazed me, you know, you think that, you know, here we are in the 2000s and it's still, fabric is still around, but it, it's, it's a very versatile, lightweight material. It and that's still has some advantages. And and one of them is the very lightweight. Another one is easy repairability in the yeah. field. Uh, and especially like for the for the bush pain guys up in Alaska yeah. and out in Montana. Well, now they're landing off airport a lot. They're landing, you know, on, on rocky shorelines and, and riverbeds and all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, sticks are flying up and rocks are flying up. And every once in a while it's going to uh, poke a hole through that fabric. And they want something that they can repair very easily at their home shop or yep. whatever. You know, they don't want to have to you know, have a, a great big giant shop and all kinds of specialty tools. Yeah. They just want to get the thing flying again. Yeah. They're working airplanes and they're, yeah. they're using them for their livelihood. Sure. So, so fabric still has a lot of, uh, a lot of appeal for, for a lot of these different you know, little segments of the market. So yep. you'll find a lot of fabric covered airplanes out there uh, even today. So, so it's, it's, it's not really a lost art yet. Uh, there's still a lot of it going on and, uh, uh, especially for uh, a first project, it's it's very simple to do, which you're going to see here as we demonstrate it sure. in a little bit, and uh, it's it's really not a bad way to uh, to build a nice light, and it's inexpensive too. It's t it's a little bit time consuming, especially if you're going to do the whole aircraft. Well, I think that's the problem is you know the, the materials themselves are inexpensive, right. but if you're having someone else do it because you, you say the time right. it takes. That time cost if you're, factor if you're really. Pay, if you're paying somebody to do fabric cover your airplane, it's going to be an expensive job because yeah. there's a lot of manual labor involved. You're right, a lot exactly. of you know very detailed ironing and sanding and, and spraying and brushing and all kinds and of fitting stuff. Fitting up and things. So it's 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 a time consuming process, but it's it's quite simple actually, and it's it's very easy to do, which we're yeah. going to demonstrate. And, here and, and if bit. you and if you can learn to do it, and again, like we've been talking about in, in this entire series, is all of these processes are real basic and very simple. Right. Once you kind of uncover it, look underneath the covers and, and see how they're done, mm -hmm. anyone can do it. I will, it's really I, not I'll, that challenging I'll tell my own personal experience in that regard. My, uh, my first project, uh, right after I got my pilot certificate and bought my first airplane, I bought a Piper Tri-Pacer. Yeah. And flew it for a year as a Tri-Pacer, but all of the, my mentors were World War II pilots and they all flew you know, DC-3s and P-51s and all this stuff. And they're, yeah. they're telling me, you know, if you're yeah. any kind of pilot at all, you gotta have a tail dryer. That's right. just the only way there is to go. Of course. You know, you know how that is. <laughs> yeah, it's still so, is today. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you still hear that stuff. And so, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to live up to these guys. And yeah. so I start looking around and I find out that uh, there's a, an STC conversion to take my tri-pacer and make it into a Piper Pacer, which is the tail wheel configuration. Sure. So my first project as a budding EAA member was to convert my tri-pacer to a pacer, and one of the things I was the most concerned about was the fabric covering, because it's the one thing that I'd never done. I grew sure. up on a farm, so I knew how to weld and yeah. all this other stuff, but it's like, I, this fabric covering is mystifying to me, yeah. I have no idea. So with the, you know, with the encouragement of my EAA friends and whatnot, <laughs> I, I ordered some material and I got the airplane all physically converted and I'm ready yeah. to do the fabric work, and I was fascinated and how simple it was. I was just, my, my angst was totally unwarranted. Yeah. I, I, it, just, it really was, I just, it's, it really is quite simple and basic once you get past that mystique of, 
you know, there's got to be something hard about this. I mean, it's, it's, not. It, it's really eye-opening because you do this stuff and you step back and you go, wow, Yeah. it, it just turns out so good. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's exactly what happened to me. I had some fabric patching to do under the fuselage and I, I kind of scratched my head a little bit and I got under there and all of a sudden it's like, oh man, this is yeah. really pretty easy. Yeah. And pretty soon the aircraft was done. So, I mean, it, it truly is an eye-opening thing when you first get into it, but sure. very, very simple. So you do need uh, uh, some tools. Very simple tools, again, uh, as we've talked about in, in some of our other workshops, most of this stuff is something you're probably already going to have yeah. or something you're going to buy at your local hardware store or at the local seamstress fabric yeah, shop. Yeah, okay? arts and craft store kind of a thing. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to need a good pair of scissors. Yeah, uh, sharp, gonna, sharp scissors. Sharp scissors for this one, yeah. You're Get gonna, a, uh, what I found when I've done some fabric, I, don't, I haven't done a lot of fabric work, but some of the things I've done, it's absolutely essential to have a scissor sharpener. Yep, you want to uh, keep it really sharp. Really yeah. sharp. Yep. I mean, you're going in there, I mean, literally sharpening it every day. Yep, yeah, you want to make sure that you can really make that, that real sharp cut and not have to, you know, saw on it and yeah. get all kinds of little fuzzy fabrics right. coming out. You want to make sure a nice, clean cut. So yeah. Keep those scissors sharp. Um, a lot of the stuff you can get at your local paint store. We're going to get some different size paint brushes because some of the yeah. some of the stuff is used for brushing. And these things are again disposable yep. uh, process. So we're yep. taking uh, the, the real inexpensive bristle brushes. This is a one inch bristle brush. Yep. You probably use a two and a three inch maybe. Yeah, for doing wide, broader surfaces. surfaces. Yep. But these are the the throwaway type brushes. You don't want to get an expensive paint brush that you have to clean or anything. No, like and that. and sometimes you can clean them, and you know you may get one or two uses out of them. But after a while, it's just easier to throw them away and start yeah. with a fresh one right. because you're going to get a better job out of it. So, yeah. uh, depending on what stage of the process you're in. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want some paint brushes. Uh, you're going to want a, a nice area to work where you're, you know, because this is going to get, there's going to be some dripping going on and some stuff. So get some plastic on the floor or make sure yep. that you're in an area where you're going to be able to clean it up easy. Sure. Again, we talked about ventilation. You want to make sure that it's well ventilated. So when you're using the materials, when they're in their wet state, they are off gassing because they are solvent based. Yes. So you're going to get some, some fumes. Uh, if you do it in your basement, uh, the people that are upstairs are probably going to complain a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it does, more of a garage. Project. It does have a smell. You're going to want to do it in the garage or in your workshop or in your hangar maybe or something. Watch out if you have gas-fired appliances too. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. You want to make sure you stay away from the open flames and that kind of thing. Yeah. So there is some safety to be involved in that. The other thing is, uh, like any chemical process, you want to make sure you're not getting it on your skin. Yeah. Um, so you're going to want to use nitrile gloves or, or latex gloves or something like that just to protect yourself and not be soaking that stuff into your skin. Right. Uh, the solvent in the material isn't quite so bad, but uh, uh, this particular process, the polyfiber process, a lot of the prep work and some of the cleanup work, you'll use MEK, yeah. which is a very, very volatile solvent that'll really get into your skin. It's very dangerous. Yep. So, um, you want to make sure you be careful. You want to make sure you protect yourself from that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, hundreds of people use it on a daily basis. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's all a matter of just thinking it's forward. Common sense. And, yeah. Common sense. Yeah. The other thing is that um, the initial processes that we're going to show you today are are brush on processes. Yeah. But it does get to a point that you have to spray this material mm. so you are going to have to have some sort of a spray equipment um, if you have an air compressor and a, and a regular automotive spray gun that's fine uh, if you don't have you might want to think about one of these turbine driven high volume low pressure the systems HVLP yeah, system that, yeah. those work really well in this fabric you got to yeah. get the right size nozzle which is talked about in your manuals yeah uh, but it, once you get set up that those HVLP systems work very very well for fabric covering and they've really come down in terms of pricing yes. I mean you, they used to be thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. and now they're now they're not, they're not that. bad at yeah. all, yeah. And if, if you're going to do a, especially if you're doing a whole airplane, you're going to really appreciate that investment you made in that equipment because it's going to make it so much easier and so much better quality. It's kind of like sheet metal. I mean, you can, you have some of the basic suite of tools, but there's one or two kind of specialty tools right. you need to invest in to do a good job. Right. And, and the same thing with fabric with the, with the spray system. Yeah. The good, the good news is, though, when you're doing it, again, you're taking away that cost of labor. Right. So even though you might be investing in a, a spray machine mm -hmm. that is, you know, five or eight hundred or whatever dollars, you're saving so much money by doing it yourself right. and really building up an incredible experience level that you can use to maintain the aircraft later on and maybe even help someone else in your chapter. Well, that's another thing. Buy, this know? is another nice tool for a chapter tool crib to buy. Yeah. We talked about tool cribs in our yeah. sheet metal workshop, but this is another one where, you know, if, if uh, there's three or four chapter members that are building a fabric covered aircraft, you might go together and invest in uh, an HVLP system and yeah. then put it in the chapter a tool crib and then everybody can use yeah. that same system and so you're not each individually investing in that uh, system you may only use the one time that's a great idea
year. So, yeah. so that's another way to, to you know, kind of mitigate that cost and make it a, a real cost effective project. For sure. You. So, um, so yeah, so you're going to get your scissors, you're going to get your brushes, you're going to get yourself ready to, uh, to uh, uh, catch all the drips and whatnot and some plastic coating or, or whatever. And then when you get to the spraying, you're either going to have a, uh, it probably the best if you have available somebody with a spray booth or you can build a spray booth. And we have some plans that are available through EAA. Uh, building a home built spray booth it's really simple yeah to I've do. seen those you can use PVC pipe and yeah. sheet plastic yep. and all different uh, ways yeah, to yeah, build those get yeah. a get a explosion proof fan to use to draw the air through and some furnace filters and, sure. and it's really easy because you want to contain it because even spraying with an HVLP system you are going to get some dust and if you're yeah. just spraying in your open shop you know like if I'm spraying a red airplane pretty soon everybody everything's Everything got a light red, coat of, yeah. of red dust on it so yeah. you want to be able to contain that and the other thing speaking of that overspray and that dust you want to protect yourself too you're going to want to wear a respirator possibly some goggles maybe a full face respirator or whatever yeah uh, especially if you're going to spray uh, the two-part uh, polyurethane top coats yeah so let's talk about respirators real quick there's yeah several there's kind of as i see it three different mm -hmm. levels okay right. you have your basic dust mask yep. which is everyone's wearing right now an yep. n95 style mask yep. okay that's that uh, reduces an inhalation of dust and the things like that particulates right yeah. the next step up is the charcoal uh, cartridge filter mask right. yep. so that's helping to protect from the solvents mm -hmm. so what those uh, charcoal filters do they're called organic vapor cartridges mm -hmm. so they're filtering out the organic vapors, the MEK smells, right, and that's a that goes again over your nose yeah, and your and mouth, seals against your face, and, yeah. and the cartridges are generally speaking replaceable. Mm -hmm. So when you see those kind of like gas mask style things, yeah. and those are readily available at hardware stores, yeah, or auto parts stores, yeah, uh, any place that sells automotive paints or any right. paints will have those. And then yeah. you can use those with uh, uh, dust filters on top of those. So that's a, a, a common yeah. way to do it. That's what I've yeah. used in, in the yeah. past. What I did was I went one step further than that, and they have what they call the positive pressure mask, right. Exactly. Exactly. which is the same basic rubber mask that goes on your face, but it has an outside air source that's pressurizing that so that when you breathe in, you're breathing that air that's coming in from outside, and when you breathe out, you exhaust it out into your paint booth, Sure. but you're never breathing in that ambient air that's in your paint booth. It's, yeah. it's a fresh air supply mask yeah. that goes right to your face. That That's the ultimate. And those are really slick. And, and, and the one I had didn't have a, a full face shield. It was just the just mask. Just on the mask, yeah. But, and of course, I put goggles on over that right. just to protect my eyes. But of they course. do have the same thing that actually seals whole, against your whole face. Yeah. And, and right. that's really the ultimate way to do is with an outside air source. Again, yeah. a little bit more expensive, uh, but you might be able to share that expense with others in your chapter, um, or uh, maybe uh, maybe you got a friend that's an auto body guy that'll let you use his equipment or something. Right. You never know. There's lots of different ways to get above, get above that. Well, the good thing about that too is depending on the the paint gun system that you invest in, mm -hmm. uh, that turbine, that air supply system, mm -hmm. not only supplies the paint gun but can also supply the mask yeah too. the newer ones do have the, the the cutout where you can get use that turbine to supply both your paint sprayer and your mask mine yeah. was two separate ones because sure. they're older systems but yeah. yeah now they have actually combined that but there's you. lots of different ways you can go about it yep. but one of the things to keep in mind is you can't just use a regular just a n95 mask no. paper mask because that won't filter out the right the, the it'll solvents. get the particulates but it won't get the the, the solvents and you so. want to get rid of that stuff yep, more so exactly. yeah so. Mm -hmm. So good, so the other thing you wanna do, um, now that your shop is prepared and you're ready to, to dig into the project, the other thing you wanna do is, is whatever system you decide, whether it's Folly Fiber or if it's Stewart's or if it's Air Tech or whoever it is, Follow their system religiously. Do not mix and match. That's critical. It's very critical because all of these materials are different. This is a vinyl process. Stewart's is a water-based process. AirTech is, is another process altogether, and there's other ones out there too. Uh, but you mm. can't mix them. They don't, they don't work together. Right. They, they, it, it looks okay, but it, it won't work. Chemically, it, over, it's time, not, over time, it yeah, will not it, hold it, up. It will just fall apart. It, yeah, yeah, it will not hold up. So get your manual, polyfiber manual, whatever it is, read it through and be ready to follow every step in there uh, and using the materials they recommend because that's the only way you're going to get a quality project. Sure. And that goes down to preparation as well. That's, um, that's another key part. Yeah. Too. we're. Uh, we're going to use this wooden frame here to do our demonstration today, but if this was a wood wing that I was getting ready to cover, before I'd even think about covering, I would find out what uh, material my covering process recommended to pr treat this wood. It's yes. probably going to be some kind of an epoxy varnish or something like that, but yeah. I would make sure that before I even worked on treating this wood, I would get 
you know, decide which covering process I'm going to use, and I would find out what material they want you to use to yeah. treat that wood so that I know that when I use my adhesive to glue my fabric to my wood, it's not just going to lift that. that yeah, uh, and, and, th and that's really important because the solvents in the uh, materials that are using the polyfiber system, yeah. if it's a solvent-based coating, yeah. it's just going to melt that coating. Exactly. It's just gonna, so you want to use that two-part, the epoxy yeah. or whatever. And Usually whatever, it's a two-part epoxy. It is, is yeah, use, and, so. and that's the same for the metal. If you're doing a tube and fabric airplane where you've got a steel tube fuselage, again, you want to use the the primer for that tubing yeah. that they recommend for the covering system you're going to use because you that'll give you your, your really the only perfect result, but it'll give you your best results. Yeah. So you won't have problems down the road. Yeah, and that's so important it's because very important. Not not only but in terms of you know the longevity and safety, but just the, the time it takes to do that. You don't want to have to do it over because right. you've, you've made a mistake. Right, and and especially you know you realize that you're covering you know wings or you're covering a fuselage. Now you assemble that aircraft. If you have a large scale repair you have to make, you might be disassembling that aircraft in yeah. order to, to properly make that repair. Sure. Um, so you've got all that extra labor involved too yeah. that you just want to avoid by just doing the process right in the first place yeah. is really what it boils down to. Follow the instructions. Follow the, yeah. <laughs> but keep Which on I know, that. I know a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, you know, aren't as good at following instructions as others, but in this case, it's really, it really, really critical. It really is critical, critical yeah. Mm -hmm. And the manuals are available online. I mean, uh, if you want to just read about it before you start out, uh, most all these companies have their manuals available on their website. Yeah, if you go to like the Polyfiber website, uh, they have the manual that you can download, yep. and they've got uh, instructional videos as well. Correct. Uh, yep. That takes you through the process step by step. So it makes it really yeah. easy if you've never done it before or yeah. if you don't have help. But yeah. generally speaking, you can connect with a EA technical counselor or like we were mentioning before, a chapter. Yeah, yeah, that's your, uh, another builder that's already been through the, I mean, that's yeah. the way, w when I did my project that I talked about earlier, it's just a matter of drawing on my EA uh, network that was in my local yeah. uh, area there. And you know, some other guys had built aircraft or restored aircraft before. and. I talked to them and, and you know, built that confidence level up to where I felt like, okay, I can do this. And by golly, I, I could. Yeah. <laughs> it was as simple as that. And we also have a really, really intensive two-day workshop, the EA Sport Air Workshops, that covers fabric covering too. Uh, and we've had a lot of great results with folks that literally have come in not knowing anything about this and going out saying, wow, I can do that. It's, and yep. feeling good about that, exactly. giving them the confidence. Exactly. So, so um, and, and the other thing is the materials, all of these manuals generally have guidelines on how much material you'll need to do whatever size aircraft. Well, yeah, that's the big thing. Okay, so I've got a Piper Cub. Yeah. How much do I need? Right. You know, how much is it going to cost yep. up front? So they have guidelines yeah, on in, what in, in the in the, the manuals. Yeah, yeah, in the manuals themselves, and also a lot of your supply houses like Aircraft Spruce, they actually on in their catalogs and on their website, they'll have some general guidelines. If you've got an aircraft the size of a Cub or a Champ, you're going to need this many yards of fabric, and you're going to need this many gallons yeah. of poly brush, and and on down the line, and they'll give you a pretty good idea so that you don't underbuy or overbuy. Yeah, and make it pretty simple. Yeah, make that it pretty way. simple, mm -hmm. yeah. So you get the, the right amount of material right off the bat, and you just can go to work on it. Yeah. You do your prep work, get yourself set up, and uh, you're ready to go. Uh, some of the things you'll need, we talked about tools a little bit, other than just the scissors and the brushes and that stuff, you're probably going to want some of these uh, paper cups like this. Yeah. Uh, these are real handy for uh, pouring small amounts of either the adhesive or the uh, the dopes in. Yeah. And uh, they're you know totally disposable. You don't have to worry about yeah. cleaning them up or anything. And you, those are readily available from aircraft spruce and other sources. They're just standard yeah, portions. Yeah, and up. you can even buy them at, at some local, local yeah. uh, shops if they are like uh, party supply houses and stuff like that. So the key you want to watch is make sure they're totally paper, yep. no coatings no coat, at all, yep. no plastic coating, no wax coating because yep. the solvents can attack those. And the other thing that's a good idea, and since you mentioned plastic, the other thing a good idea is don't pour this in a plastic cup. Yes. It is solvent based Loop. and the plastic cup will soon disintegrate yeah. and I mean you can literally watch it because it yeah. happens that fast yeah. and pretty soon whatever you poured in there is all over it's your all, Yeah. So you want to <laughs> definitely go with glass will work okay, yeah. glass is fine, uh, but the, the disposable paper cups, bare paper, non-coated paper is, is really the, sure. the quick way to go on that. Yep. So, so yeah, don't use the plastic. That's, <laughs> that's kind Sounds of, like you've done it's that It's kind before. of fun to watch, but it's really kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a mess. So right. we don't want to do that. You'll need some stirring sticks, again, from your local paint shop. Yeah, these are just that. like, this is a tiny one, but just right. a, a paint stirring stick, yep. nothing special that R way. Yeah, just, I mean, what just, happens is the contents tend to settle. If they're those vinyls the shelf, and things. Yeah. yeah, so you get got to mix them up, just like any kind of paint. Yeah, exactly. 
has the solids in there will settle out over time. Uh, and a lot of times, if you just get them freshly shipped to you, maybe the shipping is agitated enough that they're not real settled out too yeah. bad. But you definitely need to get in there and uh, agitate that up so you get sure. all those solids properly distributed in the in the, the solvent. Yeah. So and. Uh, the other thing you're going to want like, uh, is something to pour this in. If you're, uh, you know, we're going to work out of this can today, but uh, a big gallon can of I mean, stuff is yeah, hard to usually handle. A gallon yeah, can. It's hard cars. to handle and easy to knock over. Yeah. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> but uh, uh, you can either get a, a paint trough, you can pour it in there. Yeah. Um, or a lot of the folks will take an old, uh, you remember these old this kind of rectangular gallon cans that used to get like, uh, you know, different uh, yeah. material to break fluid or sure. take those and clean them out and cut a, a, like a corner out of them so that you can stick your paintbrush right in there. You've got a handle and on top. And they've got a handle. Yeah. Handle on top. It sits nice and solid on so the you bench. you can carry it as you're You can carry it along and you can just dip in there and they, those work really great too. So you can kind sure. of make your own tools in that respect. Yep. And uh, that way it's a little easier to pour it around than sure. trying to hold one of these in your hand. And it, and it holds more material as well. Great. Um, some of these materials will have to be thinned, uh, yeah. reduced. Uh, so again, use the proper reducer that they call for in the manual. Don't go just grab some paint thinner or something off the shelf. That's yeah, so actually polyfiber has, again, in their whole system, they have the reducers and the cleaners, right. the prep right. things, yep. the whole system, all the all the chemicals you need. Yeah, and another thing to think about in that respect is uh, what are your environments in your shop? What's the temperature? What's the humidity? Yeah. Um, if you got really high humidity, uh, that's really a big. That's going to be too. a problem. And what they they do to combat that is they what they use a retard. So it, it slows the the off gassing process a little bit, so it doesn't blush in the high humidity. Um, if you have a higher temperature, they want you want to slow that process down because you want it to cure at a rate that is proper for the material. Yep. So um, and if you if you got your normal 65 to 75 degrees, then you use the regular reducer. Sure. And, and as long as it's less than about 70 percent humidity, you shouldn't have a problem. So unless you're on the coast in the summer where it's 95 degrees outside and 95 percent humidity, uh, that's going to be an issue. You're going to yeah. you're going to have problems. Uh, sure. So you really need to combat that. So yeah. try to try to get in an area where you don't have to fight those environmental yeah, environmental it's problems. like anything. If you're comfortable, the process is generally speaking going to be comfortable Correct. too. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Yep, absolutely. So, so let's uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the actual process here. And again, yeah. we're going to do just a, a real quick little little project here. We're going to pretend that this uh, wooden frame is our our tail surface here. Yeah. And we're going to go ahead and just uh, just do a real quick cover on one side of that. Uh, so as you mentioned before, this will be prepped in advance. We'd use a two-part coating, a two-part epoxy yep. to essentially seal and protect the surface, be it wood or metal steel or tube whatever it might or be. Or yep. even aluminum. aluminum yeah. yeah, there are there are some aircraft that have aluminum tail surfaces that yeah. are covered with fabric. A lot of your World War II fighters were exactly that. Yeah. If you look at a P51 Mustang, which is a you know 400 mile an hour airplane. The ailerons and are rudders covered. and aler uh, elevators are fabric covered on those airplanes. Well, our B-17 and the B-25, there are all elements of that that yeah. are fabric covered. Yeah. And again, that was that for way. lightweight and for easy repairability easy, in the field. Yeah, yeah. right. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you'll run into it even on some of those higher performance aircraft. Sure. So this is our, our uh, polyester fabric. And the, this will be marked if it's, if it's a standard uh, category fabric. It Actually, really, there's a stamp on it yeah. right here. We can yeah. roll it out. Yeah, so if you're covering a, a standard category okay. aircraft, there we go. if you're covering a standard category aircraft, you need to follow what they call an STC, a supplemental type certificate. Which is an FAA be, certification. It has to be approved. And so you'll need the fabric that has this appropriate uh, stamp on it that yeah. shows that it is actually the FAA approved fabric. Yeah. So you'll get the fabric that's appropriate for your job. And there are some uh, non-FAA approved fabrics which are literally made in the same mills, but they don't go through the same testing process. So you can buy those less expensively if you're building a, an amateur built aircraft, an experimental aircraft of some sure. kind. So you can buy experimental fabrics, but most of the time you just you end, you up, might as well go with you the, end up with the standard, the the deal, standard yeah. category stuff. And so we're going to just, uh, we're going to just go ahead and lay this out. And it might be worth mentioning in terms of fabric, there's actually three basic weights of fabric. There's light, medium, and heavy. Right. Light is for ultra light style aircraft. Right. Medium is for general purpose, most R2, four place aircraft. Most all of the aircraft we build generally go with the medium. Yeah. yeah, and the stuff like the B-17, B-25, P-51, 
heavy might go with the heavier yeah the other aircraft that go with the heavier stuff is like agricultural aircraft oh sure um where they're crop gonna, dusters and yeah, things, they're, yeah they're gonna you know they're working airplanes that are gonna be worked hard and yeah. they'll want a little bit more durability from you know picking up rocks and stones on their airstrips yeah. and you know flying over you know stuff might be flying up as yeah. they're going across the field who knows what so, so this is a medium fabric it's a medium weight fabric it's so actually is, printed on there on the sticker yep. or on, so on this, the uh, stamp so yeah. this is very you know this is commonly what you'd probably use for your for your aircraft and yeah let me get this out yeah, all we're going to do is we're just going to very very roughly uh, cut out a piece of fabric that we know will will cover what we're going to want and we'll trim off the excess later it's the nice thing about it is you don't have to trim it to fit right off the bat you can just, yeah. you can just work with a kind of a rough cut here and for this exercise and typically what you're doing with an airplane too you're covering one side first slipping it over and covering yeah the that's side. what we call the blanket method um, where you cover like the entire top of a tail surface and you'd get that glued on and you flip it over and you cover the entire bottom sure. with another sheet and then you'd move on to the rest of the steps of the process sure there is another way that they do it on especially on standard category plane called the envelope process where they've actually pre-sewn an envelope that goes over like say the fuselage it looks like a big sock exactly <laughs> that's exactly right and you put it on and kind of get it in place and then glue around the edges and then and go ahead custom and, and, fit for yeah. for a particular aircraft yeah, yeah. exactly it saves um, a lot of time if it's a larger aircraft where you can't get sheets of fabric wide enough to do it that's a good way to go sure um, but a lot of your smaller aircraft and a lot of your home builds you'll be able to get a fabric sheet wide enough to do the the blanket yeah method. and sure. it's, it's a little cleaner because you don't have any seams anywhere yeah. to try to hide so nicer mm -hmm. yep so so we're just gonna you know literally, literally really rough cut this uh, to, just to get us started so I'm gonna just start here and I'm gonna and our speaking of not so sharp scissors <laughs> If these were really sharp, I could just take this and go zick right across there. Well, it's funny because I actually did go through the sharpener with those, but they got a I little, guess I didn't they, do they've it got some, They've got some, some uh, dope on some them. Some junk on it, yeah. Uh, so they're not, not quite as quite as sharp, sharp as we'd like them to be, but that's, we're just going to... Not too bad. Yeah, we're just going to cut that off here, like I'll that. I'll take that out of the way here. All right, and we're going to just kind of trim it down so it's a real workable size here. We don't want it to be too oversized, but we don't want it to be short either, so... We're gonna go ahead and trim a little bit of this off on this side. Yes. Yeah. What is that? Measure twice, cut once, so you don't end up yeah. to redo things. Like Otherwise, that. you cut it off twice and it's still too short, and that's not really the way to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just gonna cut this off to get us started. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna pour out some of the adhesive, which is called the poly. Poly tac. Yep. That's the, for our first order of business is the poly tac. And probably the best way to describe that make it really simple is it's, it's kind of like rubber cement and it truly is yeah this is a vinyl based process so um, and of course here we're using our protective uh, personal protective equipment here so we're going to put on our nitrile gloves so that we don't uh, get our fingers involved in that uh, adhesive here that we're working with so this product is used as is out of the can you don't have to reduce it or anything uh, it can be as it gets older over time it will gradually thicken because some of those Solvent uh, solvents evaporate. will evaporate out yeah. even if it's sitting in the can yep. um, so if it does get to where it's really really thick you can thin this with MEK to bring it back to its original consistency and it'll sure. be just fine it'll work great um, but normally if it's a fresh can you just use it right out of the can I'm gonna grab my brush here that Mark had ready and the, the, the thing to remember about this poly tack is it dries pretty quickly. So if you're doing a 12 foot long wing section, you don't want to go along and put poly tack along the whole 12 feet. Yep. When you come back to the others, it's going to be dry already. Sure. So you work in 12 to 18 inch lengths. Yep. And that way you know that you're going to, your solvent is not going to evaporate out of your uh, sure. adhesive and it's going to work real well yep. for you. So let's just go ahead and start out here and I'm going to brush some on this first edge here. And we're just going to work our way around this thing. And I'm just going to take that and brush a, a nice coat of that. So one, th one thing to keep in mind, too, is we're using bare wood. And the other aspect yeah. of, of pre-coating this is that the uh, uh, adhesive doesn't get sucked into yeah, the wood. Yeah, it won't soak into the wood, so you'll use a lot less adhesive yeah. than what I'm going to have to use here to get this working. There we go. So we got a nice coating of adhesive on there. And we're going to just take our fabric here. I'll turn this so you can see what I'm doing. And I'll pull that fabric up, and I'm just going to press it into that adhesive with my fingers. This is a this is a finger operation here. You don't use your brush. You don't use anything. You just press it in, and you can see that 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 uh, poly tack has uh, 
wetted that fabric and kind of soaked its way through the fabric so that it's really encapsulating those uh, fibers. I in see there. that, yeah. It's kind of like yep. when we were doing the composite. Yeah, you can, you can watch it kind of yeah. change color from a real white, bright white fabric to you can almost, it's translucent, you can almost see the wood yeah. coming through underneath it there. And that's really all there is to that. And then you, we're just going to work our way around the whole, uh, the whole perimeter of this thing. And as we're doing that, we're going to trim a little bit so that we don't get big blobs of the, on the corners here. And again, if this was an actual tail surface, we'd be coming across and we'd be overlapping another layer of fabric from the other side. Yeah. And uh, there's kind of an art to cutting and trimming. Yes. We won't very, get into that now. Very but I much mean, so. Uh, and then this is a fairly easy rectangular shape, but when you have compound curves and things, there's some special techniques that you have to use. And we do cover that in our fabric covering course. And also some of the Hints for Home Builders uh, talks about some special techniques. And some of the, uh, the videos that are on the Polyfiber Consolidated Aircraft Coatings website uh, gets into some more greater detail on working those extra little yeah, uh, especially, yeah, like uh, for instance, everybody's familiar with the Piper Cub. They have those uh, big round wingtips yeah, on them. Yeah, right. To try to get that fabric to lay down around those round wingtips is a little bit of an art form as well. So I'm going to just quickly work my way around here and get this fabric uh, cemented onto our frame here. Yep. Just like you would on your tail surface or your wing or whatever the case might be. Yeah. You want a good wet, good wet coating of that adhesive on there. And then again, I'm going to just pull that fabric up like this and I'm going to just press it in with my fingers to get that, uh, and my, my wood is soaking up so much of my adhesive that I'm really not getting as good of a penetration as I'd like here, but we just kind of do this a little bit quicker. You see, I got a little dry there. A little bit, but. Because it's just not, uh, again, the fact that the wood is soaking it up is, is working against us here a little bit, whereas if that wood would have been treated with the... Yeah, uh, we're kind of a skipping a step yeah, there, and that's exactly. the issue more than anything, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to try to put it on a little heavier here on this side, so maybe we can, maybe we can avoid that a little bit. The nice thing about it is there's nothing you can't fix. Uh, if you really have a mess someplace and you just don't like how it turned out, you can wipe it down with MEK. It totally and start again. Wipes away all of that, uh, all of that uh, pre previous material you put on there, and you can just literally redo it right over top of that, and it's no problem at all. And so. the good news with this too, it's not like an expensive sheet of aluminum. Right. Uh, if you do have to recut a piece of fabric, it's not as, you know bad of a deal compared yeah, yeah, you're to... Not, uh, you're not really hurting yourself cost-wise yeah. because um, it's, it's just not that huge of an investment to, uh, to uh, have to maybe redo a little piece of fabric or something. Trim this real quick so we can kind of work our way around here. Maybe. There we go. One more side to go here. I'm going to trim this right away before I even start. Need to work on these scissors. <laughs> there we go. It's operator error, I think. There we go. Let's quickly do our last side here. They're a little wetter this time, if I can. You know, we talk about the solvents, but even here, standing over it, you really don't smell that much. It's, it's not. It's, it's not, not overbearing. No, it's at not. All. As, it's not as bad as uh, some other types of solvent-based materials yeah. might be. I personally, I kind of like the smell of it. Uh, some people think it's horrid, uh, and it, you know, it's an individual thing, but it's never bothered me. There. All right. So now if I was going to continue to cover this, I would trim the rest of this off and, yeah. and then I would start with my other piece um, on the other side and it would wrap, it would overlap this completely. You always have to have an overlap. When yeah, that's it. very important. There's actually a specification for that in terms yep. of leading edge, trailing edge, how much is overlap. Right. So there's enough uh, coverage that it doesn't peel off or come right. separated. And then that'll be, ultimately that would be covered with a, a reinforcing tape as well to help that, um, help that joint. And keep the edge tight. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. 
There. Looks like we got pretty good bond all the way around for our purposes here. So there's our basic fabric. Now you notice I didn't worry at all about how tight that was. Yeah, if was you look at that, it's pretty flimsy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty loose yet. Yeah. Um, and I didn't worry at all about that because, again, unlike the organic fabrics where we had to be concerned about how much it was going to shrink, yeah. we don't have to worry about that because we can control our shrinkage because we're going to do it with heat. Mm, okay? okay. So speaking of that, the next tool you're going to need is, is an iron, and yeah. it has to be an iron. You can't use a heat gun on this. Right. Uh, heat guns... Uh, Too you, much directed focus. You can't, and you can't control the temperature. Yeah. You don't know. I mean, if you hold the heat gun this far away, how hot is that surface? If you hold it this far away, how hot is that surface? No, no control. Way, no way to know that. And there's no way to know just exactly how big of a surface you're touching sure. with that heat gun. So yep. there's no way to control, and we need to control the temperature on this. Yeah, and, it, and a good point on that is, you know, it's important to have the right temperature. If you have too much, actually, the polyester will start melting. Yeah, if you, and then, if you get over 350 degrees, you actually start going backwards. The yeah. fabric will start to loosen again. And, and, and you're and, stuck. And, and yeah, because and, and you can't fix that. Yeah. So it's really important to have a good iron, and you need to calibrate the iron. Um, and there's ways that they talk about in the polyfiber manual and in the other manuals how to do that with a, with a bulb thermometer. Yep. Or nowadays we have these the relatively inexpensive infrared thermometers. You just point at it and it'll tell you what the temperature yeah. is. And what you want to do is you want to uh, mark your temperature guide at the, the, the temperatures that you want. So you find out when it's at 200, you find out when it's at 250. Each iron is different. find out yeah. when it's at, at 350 and you yep. mark that on there because you can't go by the markings that are on it because sure. they're going to be just generic. Yep. So you need to, to calibrate your iron so that you know exactly what temperature you're putting on there. The other thing too is we're, we're, we're not using steam, you don't use water. No, don't use water. And you also want to get a very simple iron. Uh, the, the irons that have the automatic shutoffs are your worst enemies yep. because just when you're about to do things it had shut itself off so if you can get uh, just a really simple iron that doesn't have an automatic shutoff uh, it works out really well. Yeah. In fact, Polyfiber uh, and Consolidated Aircraft Coatings has just come out with a new iron that's got a digital temperature gauge and has taken out the automatic features and it, instead of the triangular shape like a traditional clothing iron, like this, it's yeah. more square, a rectangular shape. Oh, perfect. So yeah. it works out really, really nice. Yeah. So uh, if you're really going to get serious about that, it'd be good to invest in an iron. Now, it's not going to be 1995. It's a few hundred dollars, right. but it's well worth the investment. Especially if you're going to do a whole aircraft or maybe, again, another <laughs> another tool where the tool crib might come in. Yeah, in it's one, one of those specially tools that really makes your yep. your process. So what we're going to do what we're gonna do here is I've set my iron to the 250 degree level. That's yeah. what we do our initial shrink at. Okay. You will also use a 200 degree level for doing, after we put our finishing tapes on, you might want to just smooth the edges of those tapes so you actually use 200 degrees for that. So what that does is kind of soften the solvents. Just it doesn't let them get really super soft, but it kind of helps to embed things better. Exactly. So for our initial shrinking, I've gone to 250 degrees, yeah. which is our initial shrink up, and I literally just pass the iron all over this, over this fabric, and, it, and it initially looks like it didn't do anything. I'm just, I'm just going to... Give it a couple of passes at 250 here, just to get the initial shrinking going. And again, you can just start to see it tighten up a little bit yep. there. Just a little bit. And that's what we're going to do first. Get her just to start. And then we're going to crank our iron up to 350, and that's going to be our final tautness that we're looking for. So this will let the iron warm up here for just a little bit, and then we'll um, go ahead and do that, and we should get up to our final toss. To me, this is the fun part because you, you take this kind of loose, See, look and at flimsy that. material. See, look, look, look how that tightened and, up. And already. suddenly it gets nice and tight. Yeah. If you get a few wrinkles in it, just a pass with the iron. Look at that. I mean, smooth all those wrinkles right out, just as slick as can be. Watch your fingers there, yep. Mark. That's really neat. Yep. Now, yep. it's almost like a drum now. Almost like a drum. Yeah, I got to <laughs> do this a little bit more. It's just a little loose yet. When we show this in the fabric covering class, everyone just steps back in awe when they yep. see that go from that kind of loose yep. material to this nice, tight, and taut surface. Really works well. Yep. And you can even suck out some wrinkles if you have to. Yeah, it's just like magic. It is. There you go. So we went from that kind of wrinkly, soft surface to now a nice, taut surface, which really look, it's, it's just quite amazing how that happens, and it works out really well. And as you can see, with an iron, uh, it's a very simple process. Go ahead and pull that out so we don't have a hot iron sitting over here. 
So that's, uh, that's our first step. We put our fabric on and we go ahead and, and tighten it up. Yep. And, and now before we do anything else, we uh, put our initial primer coat on there, which is what they call in the case of polyfiber, it's called poly brush, yep. which is your initial coating. And it's red in color, kind of pink in color. Uh, and we've already thinned this. This is a reduced, yeah. uh, according to the manual. So when it comes in your, your gallon can or whatever, it's gonna be fairly thick. And you're gonna either have your little mixing can or your, your trough or whatever you're gonna, or maybe another empty gallon can or something. Yep. You're gonna have some way to, to go ahead and put that material in there and reduce it down to the proper uh, consistency so that you do your, uh, so that you do your. And this uh, is really an important coating because this is the coating that gets around the polyester yeah, fibers. And again, kind of locks this is a, mon in. is a monofilament fiber, so we have to completely encapsulate that fiber with yeah. this material because nothing will stick to it. It's sure. very smooth. There's yep. no nothing for it to grip on yeah. except, except this wrapping stuff actually, around it. This stuff actually grips on itself. Yeah, it's not really sticking to it. It just kind of it's mechanically holding it. It, it encapsulates yeah. it. Yep. yep. So, and again, this first initial process is brushed on, and this is the, this is the way you do it, no matter how big of an aircraft you're doing, uh, use a little bigger brush if you're gonna do a whole wing, but right. for our purposes, we're just gonna go ahead and, and you wanna brush it on so that you can kinda see that it's soaking all the way through the fabric. And you'll see like a little bit of a roping on the back of the fabric, and you'll know that you're getting full, uh, full uh, uh, penetration there. Yeah, the actual liquid is, going inside yeah. and yeah. kind of wrapping around. Now what you want to avoid doing is you don't want to put it on so heavy that it starts dripping on the other side of the fabric. Because yeah. again, if we would have another piece of fabric on the back side of this, because we've, we've done both sides, if that drips on the back side of that fabric, you end up with a kind of a little knob that sure. is really hard to make go away when you do your final finishing. So you want to be careful of that. And uh, of course, if I was going to do this as a whole aircraft project, I would do both sides all the way along the edges and everything. Yep. But really what I'm just doing is giving a nice coat of that, get that soaked through there, and uh, get those fabric uh, strands encapsulated so that we know that we'll get good adhesion of our, and you don't want to swirl around in that, you want to kind of keep your brush strokes going in one direction, because uh, ultimately after you put all your build-up coats and everything on this, you're going to sand it so that you get all that texture out of there and it'll be a nice smooth surface for you. So it sounds weird that you're sanding fabric, but right. what you're doing is it's a very fine grain sandpaper, yeah. like 400 grit, something like that. Yep. And you're probably wet sanding it. Too, yeah, you're right? wet sanding, and you're sanding. You're not sanding the fabric itself. You're sanding the coating. So you're you kind never of smoothing. You things never out. you never get down to the fabric when yeah. you're sanding. If you do, you've you've gotten you've gone too, too far. Too far, yeah. So. This nice wet coat like that, so that you can see that it's getting through that fabric and going on the backside and encapsulating those those fibers so that you got good adhesion. Because again, this material is adhering to itself. It's not actually adhering to the fabric. Sure. It's just wrapping around the fabric. And how many coats do you, of this do you put on? You'll put one coat of this on uh, by initially hand. by hand, and then you'll go and we'll, and we'll talk real briefly about your uh, uh, in, uh, reinforcing tapes and your inspection holes and all that. And you'll you put all those on after you put this first coat on of uh, poly brush. Sure. And then you'll put another coat of poly brush on. Uh, that could be brushed, but a lot of people will spray that second coat of poly brush. Yeah. To start, it just gives a nice start, get, start getting a little bit of a finer uh, finish to it. So I mean, you don't theoretically, have, you could brush everything, but yes. the spraying helps to yeah. make a nice uniform. It saves you a lot of span. It saves you a lot of sanding, is what yeah. it boils down to. Right. All right, there you have it. Now again, if I was doing this whole thing, I would go around and do the edges and then yeah. flip it over and do the other side. So that's really all there is to it for the first uh, initial primer coat. Yeah, and then, and then you end up with something that looks like this. So we're gonna set this off to the side here. And this again has been done by hand. This is a project that we've used in our uh, introduction to aircraft building right. in the workshop. So we've done multiple layers of, of uh, the poly brush. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, what we've put in is an inspection ring. So it's a, basically, it's a plastic ring. Yep, and, or, and sometimes you, I've seen some people make these out of metal too. You sure. can do either one, a real thin piece of aluminum or a piece of nylon or yep. plastic, just like and that. And then, it, then it's covered with another piece of fabric and yep. the fabric is embedded on top of that wood. And you'll, note, you'll, you'll notice that this is just a, a round circle and 
you cut this out of a piece of fabric. You just take a piece of our fabric yeah. and, and with a pencil and only with a pencil, yeah. you will draw Not a sharpie like you this. You don't use yeah. a sharpie, you don't use ink, you don't use anything yeah. except a pencil because otherwise it'll show through your final sure. coatings. So with a pencil, you can draw that circle. You know what size circle that is? That's the same size as a gallon can. There you go. So you put your gallon can on there, you draw a circle and you use a pinking shears uh, to give this uh, nice edge there. And the reason you do that is you don't want those strands to start raveling while you're trying to put it on the, the aircraft yeah so and it also gives something for that uh, your next coat of poly brush to kind of grab onto. well the other thing too is down. the surface area so just yep. cutting it straight is yep. one length of line but with the jagged edges you yep. increase the surface area so it's gonna hold on better. yep exactly so so you put your uh, you put some poly brush down wet it up put your ring on there get a nice wet layer of poly brush on there and then lay your ring down on it yep. and then uh, of course it would be full it wouldn't be cut out at yeah. that time It'd it be, would just it would be dry and yep. then, you'd cut, and then it you out. Can cut it out later. And then you can install an inspection ring. Yep. So those are just a aluminum yep. just cover little, that snaps in. Yeah, you just pop them like that. Yep. Pop them like that. It just goes in there. There's a little spring clip in the back of it. Yep. And now you can remove that during your inspection yeah. and uh, look at whatever structure or controls sure. or whatever on there. How do you get it off? Nice. Just like that. I've never done it that way. Don't so. be afraid to hit it. <laughs> this stuff, I could stand on this yeah. and you would not tear this fabric. It is incredibly strong when it's finished. Even even this semi-finished state that we have here, it's incredibly strong. Yeah. So, now, so we're running kind of tight on time. Yep. So once we get this done, the yep. poly brush, yep. then we're going to go to two other coatings. And yep. One is silver and then this blue coating. So l let's just quickly explain yep. what the, the silver coating is. This is the poly, is. what they call poly spray. Now this is always sprayed on Yeah. Um, and it basically has real small aluminum flakes in it yeah and what that does is it gives you UV protection so it's a UV barrier it reflects the UV rays so that the UV never gets a hold of the fabrics and, and again that's your longevity right there yeah potentially the UV yeah. from the Sun can degrade the the polyester Ultim fabric ul ultimately it so would. that aluminum acts as a barrier right. so that the UV the doesn't reflective coating yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you'll always put the in, in the at this point the airplane could fly just like this yep. you could leave it in silver but most people want to paint their aircraft so you have your final color code in this case we've got blue yeah and that's another polyfiber product yep. uh, and called, these are all the same basic vinyl yep. mixtures so that same chemical works structure together. Yep. same chemical structure so everything bonds together yeah. and it becomes as one yep. and so that's the the next step after your poly brush is your poly spray for your UV protection and then whatever final finish color yeah. you want. On. So it's really simple. I mean, you're just kind of, it, it's the same kind of basic processes, just slightly different materials. Exactly. Yeah, you'll do the, I mean, it's the same kind of spraying, same, uh, same you know, type of equipment you'd use and uh, the same technique. Yeah. It's just a matter of using the, the next layer of, of material. Great. So for more information, uh, go to our uh, EA.org website because we have lots of good information on fabric covering through the Hints for Home Builders, yep. uh, Technical Counselors, yep. uh, the Polyfiber uh, uh, Company, Consolidated yeah, Aircraft Coatings has a lot of good information on their, on website, their website too for yeah. use in this process. Uh, just about wrapping things up, yep. uh, once again, another simple process for building an airplane. These things are not difficult at all. Not at all. So we want to say thanks for tuning in again to the EA Together Workshop Series. I'm Mark Forrest. And I'm Joe Norris. And we will see you tomorrow. And we're going to start out tomorrow with welding, talking about gas welding and TIG welding. So we hope to see you tomorrow uh, starting at noon uh, right here from EA in Oshkosh. Thanks, everybody.
In a world of ancient avionics, one Seattle company is breaking all the rules. Now in airplanes everywhere, coming soon to your panel. There's a reason, pilots. Fly dine on. Rated A for your airplane. With plenty of top-notch how-to resources, EAA is without a doubt the home for any home builder. From sporter workshops to the online builder's log, EAA has it all. Year-round, EAA hosts sporter workshops across the United States that will help fulfill your dream of flight. Take your first step in home building or restoring at a sporter workshop. Or, if you'd rather build and learn on your own, EAA offers dozens of how-to books and DVDs in our online shop. Speaking of how-to, get helpful home building advice from EA's Hints for Home Builders video series. This series will give you tips and tricks from experienced home builders that will leave you wanting more. EAA also offers easy to access tech counselors and flight advisors. Connect with experienced pilots and volunteers for on-site project inspection and helpful advice. You can also log your projects and connect with other builders in your area for free with the EA Online Builders Log. Whether you're just starting your journey or you're